Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to have with me um, Lo Tiancheng, the co-founder and chief technology officer of Pony AI, an autonomous vehicle technology company uh, or robotaxi company that went public in November and is now expanding across the world. Hi, Kai Tiancheng. Yeah, hi. So I've, to prepare for our conversation, I spent the last couple of days talking to some of my colleagues abroad, and I think the widely held perception in places like London and New York is that China is way ahead on robotaxis. Is that true? Oh, yeah. I will say, first of all, I will say, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I will track, I will track the technology development for this industry for more than 10 years. So over the past 10 years, it's developed a lot. Uh, roughly, I would say the time back to, I would say, 2022. Most of the companies starting in both China and the U.S., they started doing what we call the operation. Operation means that, so in the China and the U.S., in some cities, the vehicle can do it without anyone, without the driver in the, in the vehicle, and can serve the operation. You can order the taxi. Then, then you can, the taxi will dispatch you to a destination, then you have to pay. It's a complete end-to-end -end experience of the robot taxi. That started three years ago. That's roughly the update for the industry. So where is China now compared to, to Europe, compared to the US in terms of robot taxi deployment and development? Oh, yeah, of course, I think China and the US are definitely one of the two of the top leading ones of the robot taxi, uh, robot taxi industry. There are many dimensions for that. You, since you ask a compare, say, there are multiple dimensions. The first one is, let's say, the site op operation area. We always started in the 10 to 20, 20 ish kilometers square, uh, square kilometers, then 10 to 100, 200 square kilometers, or even larger. Also, the size of the fleet. So we started with the 10 ish, 20, 30 vehicles, then we upside to 100, 200. That is where we are. And next step, and the many, both China and U.S. try to extend to the thousands. And for the cities, especially for China and U.S., we all both focus on the top tier, like the tier one, tier two cities in both countries. I mean, besides these cities, Pony also has been on expansion mode. Uh, you all are now conducting tests in South Korea, Luxembourg, and the Middle East. Why these countries, and how soon might we be able to see fully operational robotaxi fleets there? Oh, okay. Uh, maybe one thing we start touching that maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but I want to say the technology for robot taxi is very generalized. So we train the AI driver that will be able to drive under very different, uh, diverse driving environment, like different countries, uh, like in Singapore, people drive on the right side, on the store, on the left side, etc. So, so the AI driver. It's very, I say, it's very straightforward for the AI driver to be able to learn how to drive in different environments like other countries. Mm -hmm. So technology will not be a blocker for that technology. So that's why so most of the leading companies in the world try to extend their business market to other countries like you mentioned. So Pony AI so started our extension in the South Korea, also Europe, also Singapore, the Middle East as well. So, and then Tesla, I think Tesla got a lot of people's attention uh, because their recent launch of robotaxis in Austin, Texas. Did you, did you watch the launch? And uh, are you worried from comp about competition from Tesla? Yeah, it's a good point. So, first of course, so we do close follow the progress of the industry. And I was, uh, uh, almost all the robotaxi companies, when they start launch their product, they follow similar pro similar trajectory of the launching. Like I mentioned, we always start with some as a small area, like 10 to 20 square kilometers each. Then extend. We start with some of the good weathers, then we extend to some bad weather like the rainings. We start with a small size of the number of vehicles, then we extend to larger ones. Also, uh, for the operational mode, means that we always start with someone sitting in the driver's seat. Then we switch to someone sitting in the co-driver seat, we call the passenger seat. Then we put someone in the remote to monitor the vehicle, then we get rid of any human being. So I would say the all, almost all the company, including Tesla, also follow this the trajectory of the launching of the robot taxi. That will give us the confidence that we are doing toward the, toward the same goal and we are along the trajectory. So I mean, what you're saying is that they're following a similar trajectory to what Pony Eye has done. But will they, can they, will they take business from Pony AI in the future? Can they take business from Pony AI? Oh, in general, I would say today, uh, the market 
we still at a relative small size of fleet compared with the existing business. I would say today too early to think about of a competition. After all the companies in the industry working together, try to extend the market, try to have attract more attention to get the market to be matured. I think that will be the priority for all the companies for now. I mean, Tesla takes a quite a different technological route to some of you know, to Pony AI. The, uh, Elon Musk doesn't want to use lidar in his robo taxis. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, in general, uh, the short version is that say, this is just a, one of the minor difference in the term of technology. Like we all use in the AI approach, we use the neural network, we use end to end, we use uh, word model, we use reinforcement learning, we use a group set of sensors. And for the sensors, probably one thing is different from China and US. So especially in China, we can leverage off the much advanced supply chain. So it's easier for Chinese company to have even a lower price to purchase some of LiDAR radar sensors. That may change the decision. So for me, I would say because of also LiDAR radar, they have a similar price range compared with the camera. So that's why for me, it makes perfect sense to use a combination of different sensors. That may trigger the different decision for the sensor setup. But in general, I would say, if you're asking the difference in technology, I would say this is just a small, very small percentage of the difference for technology. So overall, back to the question, I would say majority on the tech track are also the same for different companies. And so how long might it take for Pony AI to break even, to turn profitable? Yeah, okay, good point. So I just mentioned three years ago, 2022. So yeah, we started doing operation, we started charging money. But that time, definitely we are not reached the point to, to break even, as mentioned. So there's one thing I have, we haven't touched yet, that's about the mass production. So mass production being said, I want to mass produce the vehicles to significantly drive down the cost. So over latest generation, as shown in the April, then late April, which we released, uh, we unveiled over latest generation, that we got the cost down by 70%, almost three times lower than before. Also, we already started the mass production for today and the old vehicles for the latest generation. We already started testing in Guangzhou and Shenzhen public road. Then we are planning to extend the free site to 1,000 by the end of this year. Now, that's what will be the target for the, the mentioned break-even point of the robot taxi. So Pony AI also, you know, you are headquartered in China, but you also has a, have a presence in the US. And there was a report in the New York Times late last month about Travis Kalanick wanting to buy your US unit. So what's happening there? Are you selling? Are you spinning off your US operations? Uh, sorry, no further comment I'm putting here today. But I would say we still leave the US office to have some uh, exploration or study of the latest technology, development AI technology. That's mainly for the US side. But again, no further comment can be made on this point. I mean, US President Donald Trump also has been, you know, has been a big topic of today's conversations. Uh, and there is no clear end in sight to his tensions with China. Um, how is this going to impact uh, Pony AI's overseas plans? And are you worried that Pony AI could be forced to delist from the, from the US? Uh, in general, I would say, uh, even without this, I would say global market overseas extension is one of the core business for Pony AI. They're also one of the top priority. Because again, as I mentioned, technology will be not a blocker because they're very generalized to cover different driving environment. So, you know, so it makes perfect sense for Pony, for other, also the other auto driving companies to try to extend the market uh, so over to, uh, other than the China and US. That's definitely something we will focus in the future. But so in, in, in a sense, then Pony is pretty, uh, pretty insulated from the trade war, I, I, is it? Is the company insulated? Oh, in general, I would say our supply chain is diverse. And so, okay, also, uh, for the, especially for the latest generation, so over supply chain leverage the mass produced component makes that very standard produced component. So, minor of those things can be affected by some of the geopolitical reasons, especially for that one. Mm, okay. The next topic I wanted to kind of ask about is safety. I mean, when I think okay. about robo taxis, I also think about whether I'll be willing to put my kids in a robo taxi to, be, to go to school. I mean, what would you say to parents like me and how are you going to, how, what are you doing to improve the safety or the perception of safety of robo taxis? Okay. First of all, safety is not something can be claimed. So I should not claim that this vehicle is safe. And there are multiple ways to prove that and good enough. Uh, maybe I've used the word example in China first. I will say in all the, almost all the states in China to acquire a license, we should, support, we should uh, conduct a significant mile of the testing 
to prove that your safety record is one, at least one magnitude and less tenfold safer than the just a regular equipment driver. That will be the entry point for robot taxi. I'm not saying we just have 10, 10x safer. Actually, that's the entry point. That gives the passengers, give the government, give the regulators the confidence that, or give us the confidence that we can serve without any participating of others driving. We can drive itself. I mean, but do you think do you think consumers right now? I mean, when you're when you like you have a fleet operating in China, what kind of uh, concerns have consumers voiced out, and what improvements you know, still need to be made to the service, or what what things have you all been doing to try and um, change change or improve the perception of robot taxis? Uh, good point. Uh, first half regarding the customer feeling, I would say that's a, probably the time three years ago. So. Uh, I remember a certain percentage of the customers when they took the first ride, they may be curious about safety. They may, maybe in the first few minutes, they may be unconscious a little bit about the, the, the movement of the vehicle. But later, because the vehicle moves safely, move very smoothly, they earn the confidence. We have a mutual trust of the vehicle that we started. So today, I was over vehicle per vehicle, or they have a, I was at least 15 daily orders per day, like just a regular, like a regular taxi. So this one working. But one part of that, uh, I would say one thing definitely we need to improve is the size of the fleet. We need to have more vehicles to have a better coverage. Then to significantly improve the efficiency, also reduce the time of the waiting time. Because we have more vehicles, we have less waiting time, etc. So to improve the overall experience of this fleet, of this new, new product. I mean, when people talk about AI these days, there's also a lot of worry about the jobs that AI could threaten. And uh, you know, in some places, they, they worry that, oh, maybe robo-taxis could take the jobs of uh, taxi drivers or, or ride-hailing drivers. Do you all have a view of what percentage of the, the, the taxi fleet and future robo-taxi could account for? And do robo-taxis threaten jobs as well? Oh, I will say this could be a one of the misunderstanding, i put it this way. Today, I would say even the sum of the, if we add, add all the number of robot taxis uh, in all the cities, I would say that's like lower than, especially lower than 1% or even lower, I would say. In general, robot taxi will serve as a, a serving the area that will be lack of drivers, try to complement the minimal transportation of the city. That will be the ultimate goal for the taxi. Also, another thing I want to highlight here that the, the the intention I started working on AI is I want to try to AI to improve human lives. So I will try to provide a very elegant and a decent experience to the riders, not just, I would say, to just try to compete with the existing human. That will be the ultimate goal for the AI, try to improve our lives. Maybe we can move on to some questions from the audience. I think we have one question over there. It says, what, what's going to come next after robot taxis? Uh, very good point. That's actually discussing something I want to cover next, I will say. Okay, so today the vehicle is designed for human driving. So like the steering wheel, like the panel side, like the design of the vehicle. So for robot taxi, that implies that there could be no driving the vehicle. That may indicate some of potential change of the design of the vehicle. The vehicle is designed for the passengers. We don't have to need steering wheel, so we can redesign the in-cabin experience to improve that. I would say revolutionize the vehicle design will be the, I would say the next for robot taxi. Later, robot taxi technology will enter some of the person owned vehicle, this market. That was the next big milestone for robot taxi. So when you talk about the vehicle design, I mean, how might it look like for a future passenger in a robot taxi? How could these taxis be reimagined as cars? Oh, like say, um, today, again, I say today the car design for driving. So there's a couple, just a very few of things the passenger can be done in the vehicle. But later, it could be different. You can have a conference. If you go to sport, you can have some preparation for that sport in the vehicle. So we can be purposely designed for different purposes of the rider. That will be the next one. Again, not for today, not for tomorrow, but I would say in the, long, in the future, I believe this something could change after robot taxi launch. Only, I mean, uh, uh, alongside um, robo taxis, people also talk about robo trucks. Yeah. Is that an area that Pony AI has also looked into? What do you think the potential is there for robo oh. trucks? Oh yeah, uh, Pony AI, we do have robo truck business uh, running already. Uh, again, I'll say technical side. So we train our AI driver be able to drive different, uh, drive in different environment, also the different type of cars. 
So we leverage one technology to be able to drive trucks and the taxi at the same time. So they are just technology getting mature at the same time. They are moving. So we just, uh, once they mature, we can start to uh, scale the robot truck business. Okay, we have another question. Uh, are there international regulations for driverless driving? Would meeting some, oh, sorry, I think we went back. Okay, maybe we'll take this one, the okay. latest question. If there is no safety driver, who's gonna take responsibility? Oh, okay. Uh, there's clear regulatory for that, the liability. This question asks about liability for the robot taxi. So there will be a use the, use the record collected for the, by the robot taxi design, who will be liable for the incident. Could be one of the major, could be eco, could be one of the minor. Then the technology provider will in charge of the, uh, the vehicle in charge of the, the if it's liable, then back to the, the same as the vehicle. So. Is it pretty clear in South Korea already and Luxembourg who the uh, liability lies in these countries that you are uh, testing in? So in all the areas we have operated robot taxi charging money, this regulatory has been matured for at least one year. So short, uh, long story short, I will say, in all the cities that we're operating, we already have this operation applied for more than t four years down the road. Let's take another one. Are there international regulations for driverless driving? Would meeting such standards facilitate technology transfer to other countries, ex especially Western ones? Oh, first, I hope so. But I would say it always takes time to human to learn, to get confidence about that one. So we can have some international guidance for that regulatory support for robot taxis for driverless driving. But for different countries, that depends on how long it takes the regulator to really understand, to be confident, to, tr to prove to themselves that it's, this regulator it really works. So I would say this is probably the, my, uh, my prediction for the regulatory development there. Another one, I think this is a good question. Do you yes. see companies like Uber and Grab adopting robo-taxis? Oh, we do already have a collaboration with Uber or Grab, like this called TNC, transport network provider, the, the platform. So it's a win-win situation. We can, we can yeah. uh, today we can have work with the, like, the platform like Uber to adopt the, the traffic. So we can get take orders on Uber as well. I would say that's also another big angle, big growth point for the robotic companies in the oh. future. So by partnering Uber, y'all can use that data to also train your robot taxis, is that right? Uh, uh, this is also another benefit, but the keep the more direct, we can use their traffic. We can use their, their users. So Uber users can just order the robot taxi to take the ride. So do you also, are, are you all discussing any partnerships with like uh, ride hailing companies in Asia, like Grab? Uh, I think Grab was also part of that question. Uh, yeah, uh, probably the, in the, I will say today in Singapore, we work with this, do you know, CDG, Comfort, Comfort Echo as a partner here. So yeah, we treat different, maybe we have different partners in different countries, but Singapore do use CDG as a partner. I think our time is up, so thank you Tian Cheng for, for being here with us today and thank you everybody. Yeah, thank you.